Tonight, I want to talk to you about the most important thing you might hear in this whole week, and that is about Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. We believe that Jesus Christ is in the Eucharist, don't we? Yes! But is it really Jesus, or is it just a symbol? Yes! There were less people answering that time. <laughs> Yes, we really believe that it's Jesus Christ. It's not just bread and wine in front of us. It's actually Jesus. It's transformed into the body and blood of Jesus, into Jesus himself. Now, how do we know that? We're supposed to believe that, but let's be honest. Is it hard to believe sometimes? Yeah. Of course it is. Of course it is. I have people... All the time saying, do you really believe Jesus in the Eucharist? And I say, yes. How do we know Jesus is in the Eucharist? Catholics believe that Jesus is in the Eucharist. Protestants believe that he's not, that it's only a symbol. Who's right? I always bring them to John chapter 6 in the Bible. Do you know what John chapter 6 says? Jesus says, I am the bread of life. If you feed on me, you will live forever. And the Jewish people are like, what? I want to live forever. Give us this bread. We want to live forever. And Jesus says, the bread that I'm going to give you to help you live forever is my flesh. Okay. The Jewish people were a little bit weirded out by that. They're like, well, what does this man mean that he can give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus didn't change it and say, guys, I was speaking symbolically. You know what he said? He said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood if you want to go to heaven. Now the Jews are getting really freaked out. They're like, we're going to eat your flesh and drink your blood? That's really weird, Jesus. We were up to you. We would have loved you up to this point. Now notice, right before Jesus said this, what did he do? He worked his miracle of feeding 5,000 men and 5,000 more men. He was over 10,000 people. Jesus fed with two loaves of bread and five fish. He multiplied it to show that he has the power to do anything. And he's saying, this is my flesh and this is my blood. That's why when he was at the Last Supper, he took the bread and gave it to the apostles. And he said, what? This is my Notice, he did not say, this is a symbol of my body. Notice he did not say that this represents my body. It's kind of like my body. It's metaphorically speaking my body. He said this is my body. What part of is don't people understand? This is my body. This is my blood. So Jesus really meant what he said. We can say, well, Catholics say this, Protestants say this, Orthodox say this. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, it is his body. It is his blood. And that's how he stays with us until we get to heaven. That's cool, right? Now, some people might say, okay, Brian, I know we're supposed to believe that, but it's really hard to believe. I mean, how could God get in a piece of bread, right? That's theologically inaccurate anyways, but irrelevant. I mean, how could God make himself so small? But let me ask you a question. What's easier to believe? That God could make solar systems, galaxies, and universes out of nothing in a second? Or change the bread and wine into his body and blood? I mean... For God, they're both equally easy, but for us, thinking about it, what's easier to do? Say, okay, this is my body and blood, transformed, or solar systems come into existence, universes come into existence, galaxies come into existence from nothing. Do you know what kind of power you must have to have in order to bring all that into existence from nothing? I mean, this seems like a cakewalk. For God, it's easy. I mean, think about it. God is so powerful, he's pure act. Now, what does that mean? We're not pure act. We have our brain, and we think about something, like this girl right here. What's her name? Kiara. I, I'm thinking right now that I want to high-five you. But I'm not pure act, so then I actually have to go do it, too. So, you're cool. Um, <laughs> Jesus, God, is pure act. So when he thinks it, he doesn't have to go do it. It automatically happens, because he's that powerful. He's pure 
power. So when God says, let there be light, he doesn't have to obey it. It just becomes light. But if he says, let there be planets, it happens. If he says, let there become solar systems, it'll happen. If he says, Kiara's a skunk, show me God's a skunk. <laughs> Sorry, Kiara. But in all seriousness, when Jesus says, this is my body, guess what it becomes? His body. That's exactly what it becomes. Now, some people might say, yeah, but it looks like bread. It feels like bread. It tastes like bread. And if you stick it under a microscope, it's bread. So how can you say it, Jesus? I mean, if it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it acts like a duck, isn't it a duck? No. Not in this case. Why? I want you to think about the person of Jesus Christ for a second. Jesus is God. I don't know if you guys know that. That might be a revelation for some. But Jesus is the God who created you. The God of the universe. I had a seventh grader once come up to me at a confirmation retreat that I was giving. And he was like, what? Jesus is God? And I said, yes, dude. Hashtag Jesus is God. He found me on my Instagram later. He was like, hashtag Jesus is God. I said, yes. Good. So Jesus is God. And when he came to earth as a man, did he look like God? No. He looked human. He felt human. He sounded human. If he switched his arm, it felt human. And if he stuck his hand under a microscope, it would come out human. But the cool thing about Jesus is that he proved that he was more than just human by the miracles he worked. Think about Jesus for a second. I mean, he literally, he didn't just say he's God. He wasn't just this nice guy who walked around in a potato sack and was like, yo, what up? <laughs> Be nice to each other. Jesus was the greatest man who's ever walked the earth. He walked with authority. He spoke with authority. When Jesus taught people, listen. I mean, what's your name? Michaela? I'm picking on you, Michaela. Michaela, you're blind. In the Bible. All right. I'll pick on you. <laughs> She's like, no, don't pick on me. I'm going to pick on you, Hannah. So uh, Hannah's blind, okay? There's a story in the Bible of a blind person. And Jesus comes up to the blind person, you know, because they were on the street corner, and they're in the dirt, and they're begging. Every day, they're begging for money with a little cup in front of the temple. Come on, please, can you spare some money for the poor? I can't see. I can't work. Every day in front of the temple. One day, the, pro, the blind person doesn't hear anything. It's exceedingly quiet. And then they hear this huge noise coming from that way. And the, the blind person's like, what's going on? I can't see that. There's a huge crowd coming. What's going on? And nobody answers her. But finally someone says, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth's coming. He just raised someone from the dead in the next town over. And now he's coming this way. And he says, what? Jesus, I've heard he's cured the blind, the sick, the deaf, the disease. He, he can heal everybody. Maybe he can heal me. So he comes up, Hannah gets up, and she starts yelling, the Bible says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. And you know, people are like, Hannah, be quiet. Nobody likes you. Sit down. You know, and the Bible says she screams even louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner, over here. All of a sudden, everything grew quiet. And she couldn't see, but she could feel this power, this presence in front of her. And with two words, Jesus stretches out his hand and says, be healed. And all of a sudden, Hannah, for the first time in her life, can see. And she starts freaking out. She's like, I, I can see all of you guys. I can see all of you guys. She goes crazy. She's jumping up and down. And was like, oh. You know, she, and Jesus went and healed. He looked everyone in the eye, and he healed them. He didn't just put like, duck, duck, you're all better, 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 better. No. Jesus was actually looking every person in the eye and said, I love you. I did not make you to live this way. Let me heal you. And that's why Jesus is the greatest person who's ever walked the earth, and Christianity is the largest religion on earth, because Jesus heals everybody. He proved that he's more than just a man by the miracles he worked. And the Eucharist is proven to be more than just bread and wine by the miracles that it works. You guys know the Eucharist does tons of miracles? 
But Jesus had people who didn't believe in him. Miracles couldn't happen. But every single person who believed had miracles happen. Did you guys know that there was a miracle in the 800s? There was a priest who actually doubted the true presence of the Eucharist. And he always held up the, you know, the bread at Mass and said, this is my body, this is my blood. He'd say the whole consecration, but in his mind he'd have some doubts. And he'd say, Jesus, please help me to believe. Well, one day God answered his prayer. And as he was saying Mass, he held up the bread and he said, this is my body. And all of a sudden the host started to bleed all over the altar. And it freaked him out. And it looked like the inside of the bread turned into human flesh. So he stopped mass and they basically proclaimed it a miracle that the cup had turned from wine to blood and the bread had turned from bread to flesh. And the scientists wanted to check it out. And they're like, no, 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 it's a miracle. We can't check it out. You know, that's that's it's too holy. And so the scientists like, oh, well, it's not real then until we say it's real. You know, you can go on believing your superstition. So for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, scientists wanted to check out this Eucharist. Finally, in the 1970s, they allowed the scientists to do some studies on the miracle of Lanciano, which is in Italy. And they did four different sets of studies. And in these studies, they actually confirmed that inside the bread, the outer layer was still bread. Inside was actually human flesh from the inner part of the heart. In the inner part of the heart, the, in the 800s, they didn't have the technology to get that part of the heart out. And that's to get a piece of bread. Maybe it looked convincing. These guys were saying they had no idea how it happened. Why do you think Jesus would put his heart of all things in the Eucharist? To show us he loves us. They also showed that the blood had turned into the universal blood donor type. In many other miracles, they said there's no natural explanation. These are supernatural events that science can't explain. And if you don't believe me, you can go to Lanciano today in Italy. You can go there and see it. It's still there. Or you can just Google it and save money. <laughs> I also know this girl I was talking to. And Kiara, she's about as far as Kiara was. And me and her were talking, you know? And every time we talk, Kiara, imagine if I talk to you and I stare at your feet the whole time. Would that be like weird? Imagine if I talk to you for one hour and I just stare at your feet the whole time. That's weird, right? That's what this girl did to me. She, she literally talked to me for one hour. We're both sitting on the cement, and she stared at my toes. I'm like, that's so creepy weird. I didn't know until later on that she was blind and could only see three inches, four inches in front of her. Her doctor said within a month or two she would be completely blind. And this girl gave up her dreams to go to college, her dreams to become everything that she wanted to be because she was going blind, completely blind. Well, she went to a Eucharistic adoration like this. She came to something like we're doing now. And the priest actually picked up the monstrance and he carried it around and he showed it to each and every person in the whole room. And when he stopped by this girl and made the sign on the cross, boom! Her eyesight came back like that. She said she could see all distances, all colors, and when she went to her doctor, her doctor confirmed it and said, how the heck can you see? You were gonna be blind in a month and now you can see perfectly with 20-20 vision. So she told him the whole story and the doctor's like, that's ridiculous, that's incredible. And I know another lady who had this disease that was like bubbling off of her neck and she went to the doctors and the doctor wrapped it up with like all this gauze tape and the doctor told her not to take off the gauzy stuff unless she was in the doctor's office with him and he did it. One day she went to Mass and she received the Eucharist and as the Eucharist went down her throat, as Jesus went into her throat, he healed it. But she felt like it was on fire. I mean, literally fire. And she ran out of the church, and her sister followed her. They're both running down the aisle after in mass. 
And they, she goes outside, she starts taking off her wrapping. And her sister's like, no, don't take it off. You're not supposed to take it off unless you're at the doctor's. And the sister's like, I can't help it. My, my, my throat's on fire. I just need to massage it. And when she went to massage it, all the bubbling up and all the cancer and all the disease was completely gone. She went back to the doctor's and it was confirmed that the disease was completely eradicated. There was not even a shred left of it in her body. How cool is that? It just happened to go away as she received the Eucharist. This girl just happened to receive her sight back as she received the Eucharist. I know another guy, because I get retreats around the country. I get confirmation retreats, adult retreats, all these sort of retreats. And one of our retreats, I finish all my retreats with adoration, because that's the way to go with Jesus. At one time, we put two kneelers up in front of the Eucharist, and people come up and they kneel before Jesus, and they just talk to him face to face, and they present their prayers to him. Well, one day, this big football player, this huge guy, like twice, three times my size, he was captain of the football team, and he got rolled by like three guys. He got and he, he tore all the mouth muscles in his neck. He had hurt the brother, like cracked his collarbone, like all this bad stuff, his shoulder. This thing got hurt so bad that he couldn't even sleep. He had to sleep sitting up in a chair, and that even hurt. He couldn't breathe, he couldn't laugh, he couldn't do anything, not even eat without all the muscles in that whole area hurting. Well, this kid in the retreat, big football player, comes up right in front of the Eucharist, and he kneels down, and he actually stretches out his hand and touches the monstrance. Now, this kid admitted to me later on that he was afraid to do that. You know how we get self-conscious, we care what our peers think, and so we don't do what we want because we're too afraid? This kid was like that. But he said when he reached out and touched the monstrance, this heat, this powerful like electricity heat just came through his arm and started going through his body, and he couldn't move. Even though he wanted to go sit down because he was so embarrassed, he just kept it there for 15 minutes. And the heat came down, I saw him after the retreat, and he's like, Brian, he's like, come here, I need to tell you something. And I was like, what, what do you need to tell me? He's like, I, I, you know my shoulder and everything? You know, you know how I had my hand in a sling, my arm was in a sling? I was like, yeah. He's like, it's better, it's completely healed. I'm like, and I'm kind of a skeptic sometimes. I'm like, what do you mean it's completely healed, you know? And he's like, this kid was big. He was shaking. He's like, Brian, he's like, I'm going to be honest with you, bro. He's like, I'm not the most religious person. I haven't been following God as much as I should. And I've never experienced any of this religious stuff. But Jesus completely healed my neck. And he pulls the sling out of his pocket with his bad arm and shoulder and starts like doing it like a, like a lasso, you know? And all of a sudden, he's like, look, he's like, I'm completely healed. I saw this kid a year later, he was still healed. It was a complete miracle that God did that day. The funny thing about God is he's not dead. He's alive. He still works. He's not outdated. He's not superstitious. He's alive. I have all these atheists and agnostics telling me that God's not real. I said, eh, think again. He's very real. He's alive. I tell them about these miracles. I said, you cannot disprove God. Go ahead, do that. Anyone who doesn't believe in God here tonight, come talk to me. I understand it's hard to believe in God sometimes. And sometimes people don't give us good answers. They don't tell us why we should. They just say, oh, just believe. Oh, don't question God. No. God's not afraid of your doubts. God's not afraid of your questions. He wants you to question. He wants you to understand your faith. So if you're having trouble believing, talk to one of your counselors. Ask questions. Come talk to me. I'll be happy to answer your questions. But the point is that God's real, and he came to visit us in the person of Jesus Christ, and he left us his body and blood so that we could receive it for all eternity until heaven. Now, I heard a story about a Satanist once. And this Satan, uh, she was a Catholic, and she became a Satanist, and then she became Catholic again. Now, when she was Catholic, she told her story about Satanism, and she said that Satanists steal, or try to steal, Catholic Eucharists so they can go desecrate them. Now, notice they don't go to the Protestant churches, do they? Why? Because they don't have Jesus. They just have a symbol. We have Jesus, and they want to desecrate him. They said that if you take 200 hosts that are unconsecrated before the priest blesses them, and you spread them all around 
a small part of a room, and then you let the priest consecrate one host, and you just put it in there, and then you let a real witch, like a warlock, like a saint person, come into the room, they will know, she said, in one second, which one is consecrated. Because they can detect the presence of Jesus, and they don't like it. Sometimes they believe more than we do. We need to believe. The more we believe in Jesus in the Eucharist, the more he will change our lives. I mean, a lot of you guys know my story that I used to dress in black. I used to carry weapons. I used to be really angry like a volcano ready to explode and I wanted to hurt people. And literally, that's how I lived my life for seven years. I didn't even look in the mirror for seven years because I hated what I saw. I literally thought I was the ugliest person on planet Earth. And my low self-esteem was rock bottom. Many of you guys are like, really? You were like that? Yeah, for way too long, almost 10 years. And it wasn't until God came into my life, found me in the gutter that I was laying in on the side of the street, and he picked me up and cleaned me off. And he promised to give me a new heart and a new mind and a new life. I was never happy. I was always angry. I was always resentful. I was always stressed. I was always depressed. Always confused. And then one day, I went to a healing mass. You guys know sometimes when they lay hands on people and the people like fall over, you know those healing masses? I used to like those. You guys used to like to fall over and stuff. But one day they said they were going to have a healing mass where they were going to bring the Eucharist around, kind of like they did that girl who was blind. They were going to bring it around to every person and just bless you with Jesus. And I was like, I don't want that. I want people to put their hands on me, not that. And then the priest reminded me that this is the same Jesus that walked 2,000 years ago. This is the same Jesus that cured people from leprosy, rose people from the dead. This is the same Jesus who can heal you today. And I said, oh, uh, my bad. And so I prayed, and I, I can tell you that Jesus completely took away my anger, my hatred, my desire and want to hurt people. He took all that away, and he gave me peace. He gave me joy. He gave me freedom. He gave me love. That's why I love to hug people, high five, tell jokes, play video games. I actually love life now because Jesus in the Eucharist completely healed me. Completely healed me, and it's all because of him. That's why I follow God, guys. That's why I follow Jesus. I don't follow Jesus because someone told me to or I went to religious education or I read a book about Jesus. I follow Jesus because he came to me. I know him. I feel him. I experience him. And he changed my life. That's why I follow Jesus. If you're following religion and you think it's just about a bunch of rules, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, you're doing it wrong. Religion's not about rules. It's about a relationship with a God of the universe who loves you so much that he would even die for you if he needed to. And I think that he proved that. Not only did he die with you, for you, but he actually decided to stay in a piece of bread. Of course, he's everywhere, but he's very expressly, even more, in, right here, transformed in this bread. So that every time we, you guys have heard, you are what you eat from your head to your feet. You know, we become the food we eat. So when we receive Jesus, we become more like him, if we believe it. Father said today that true worship changes your life. True worship has to be true. You have to believe it. You have to live it. For example, if you kiss someone, does that mean you love them? Not necessarily. It could, right? It depends on the motive. You might love them. Or you might just be using them to get their sister or their brother. You know, like you just might be using a person that you don't even care about. The point is, just because you kiss someone doesn't mean it's love. Just because we clap or we put our hands up or we, you know, we have fun doesn't mean we're worshiping. When we clap, guys, you guys might see me. I put my hands up in the air. It's just an expression. Have you guys ever gone to concerts? You know, and you're like, oh my gosh, just a beer. Okay, you're probably not like that. <laughs> One direction! Oh, oh. I, why did you do that? You know, it's like, don't oh, marry him. You know when we stretch out our hands because we just want to get close to these people. You know what? 
Those people don't even care about us. They don't even know who we are. We do that now in church. We stretch out our hands to Jesus and say, Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we give everything to you. You're the rock star of all rock stars. You're the king of all kings. We give all of ourselves to you. And sometimes I open my hands this way to receive what he has for me. I just give myself to him. So if you want to try putting your hands up sometime this week and just opening yourself up to God, do it. What do we do if we love something? Like when someone hits a home run, what do we do? We yeah. cheer and clap and go crazy, right? Well, with Jesus, we better than our, infinitely better than a baseball star or a baseball game or rock concert or anything. So when we clap, guys, we're not just clapping here just to have fun, even though it is fun. We're clapping for Jesus. Every clap song we do, we're doing it as a prayer to Jesus. Every time we put our hands up, it's a prayer to Jesus. This Jesus right here changes our life. And we give him our heart, we give him our soul, we give him our body, we give him our clapping, we give him everything. Because he's worth it, isn't he? Yeah. Isn't he? Yeah. Yes, he is. And if you let him, he will change your life this week. Take a chance with Jesus, especially all the people here who are new. Maybe you're still freaked out, you're like, okay, I've never done anything like this before. Take a chance with Jesus this week. Some of you guys come from homes that are broken. Some of you might be broken like me. Some of you might have anger. Some of you might be super depressed. Some of you might cut. Some of you might have eating disorders. Some of you might have rock bottom low self-esteem. Some of you are like overachievers and you do everything you're supposed to do only to run away from all your problems. Some of you bully. Some of us have addictions. So we all come here broken. But Jesus says to you, my daughters, my sons, I didn't make you to be broken. I made you to be happy. I made you to find life and to have fun and to enjoy this life. I made you to be holy and get to heaven, not to be in the addictions and stuff that you're in. Let me heal you. Take my Jesus wants to heal you this week. What do you have? Every time you come before Jesus during these adoration times, you guys should be bringing your problems to him. Say, Jesus, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know who I am. I don't even know why I'm here on this earth. I need your help. I need your guidance. My heart was broken by my last girlfriend or boyfriend. I'm still hurt. That was a year ago, God, and I'm still crying over it. Please heal me. My parents are divorced. My parents got divorced seven years ago. I prayed to God that they wouldn't get divorced. And they did. So I felt like God wasn't answering my prayers. I felt like God wasn't listening to me. I mean, I'm praying for all these things and God's not listening. He was listening. He just couldn't change their stubborn hearts because they weren't listening. But my brothers and sisters and me, we didn't give up. We know that God's a God of miracles. And so we kept praying, and we kept praying, and we kept praying, and kept praying, all of us, all the time. And a couple years ago, my parents got back together. They were on a second honeymoon, they bought a new house, and they were honestly doing better than they've ever been doing before. So last thing I want to say, when you guys come to Mass, what do you do after receiving communion? Pray. What did I do? What did Brian, here's Brian. Brian going up to Mass when I was younger. Oh, she's cute. Oh, she's cute. Whoa, real cute. You know, I didn't even think about Jesus always receiving. I was just, oh, I know him. Oh, look at that guy. I gotta call that guy. gotta hang out. I thought about everything except Jesus. When you guys are going up to communion during Mass, Think of Jesus. Think of Jesus on the cross. He had all his skin ripped off for you. He had three inch like thorns going through his skull, 30 of them, beaten into his skull. He had eight to ten inch railroad spikes drilled through his hands and his feet. All to say, please see that I love you. Look at how much I love you. And I even give you myself. Then after you receive Jesus in the Eucharist, go back to your seats, your pews, and pray like you've never prayed before. Even if your family and your friends stop praying, you pray, you say, thank you, Jesus, and you keep your life. You say, Lord Jesus, I want to go to heaven, I want to live for you, I want to follow you. Help me, just pray to Jesus. Don't pray to him up in heaven. 
Pray to him in your hearts because you just received him. And as soon as I'm done, in one second, Kev's about to start playing the music again. When he starts playing the music, that's to help us to get to worship Jesus. Are you guys ready to worship Jesus? All right. I guarantee you, if you give everything you are this week to Jesus, and you open up and you give it a try, you can't outgive God. He will bless you abundantly, and he will give you what you need this week. Amen? 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 Amen. All right. Thank you, Jesus.